All right, we are now officially live. It's 9.59 and I am not seeing attendees come in. All right, they're starting to come in now. Hello everyone and welcome to the STG Talks Roundtable here on STG5 on this wonderful Friday uh, Friday morning, Friday afternoon, Friday evening, depending on where you are and where you're located. We are going to get started in a few minutes here. Let the, everyone who signed up um, for the webinar round chat, uh, round table to, to come in. So still 10, gonna wait, wait a few minutes here, but a little bit about uh, myself and SDG Talks. So we, this is our third round table that we've hosted. Our first one was on sustainable fashion, second on sustainable tourism. Now today on SDG Talks uh, or on uh, SDG 5, gender equality. Um, so we're continuing to, to host different monthly roundtables, two podcasts a month. So if you've got thoughts, ideas, questions for future roundtables or podcasts, we wanna hear from you. Um, so again, this is, this is one, of, one of many that we'll continue to host. And again, just so grateful and for your time and for you being here today. And uh, just gonna wait another minute or two. We did start early. I had 175 or so join us here or sign up today. And uh, Cash, I see you are uh, joining from a second spot. That, that's fine. Um, we'll still wait a second here, no problem. And so I had a 170 sign up. Uh, still some people rolling in and we will start and maybe now just for the sake of time. And of course, for everyone else that's gonna listen afterwards, um, for for the sake but just for the sake of getting getting started here um you know we'll just kind of launch it but here thank you again for everyone who who is here um this is the sdg talks sdg5 roundtable on gender equality um all the sdgs are important um but today sdg5 is a, a little bit extra important and we're going to deep dive into it and Obviously, as you can see over my shoulder, I got all the SDGs here. There's 17 of them. They're all intertwined and interconnected in certain ways. Um, but today, we want to dive into SDG 5. And what is the goal of SDG 5? Very much to achieve gender, gender equality and empower all women and girls around the world. Um, SDG 5 is not just a fundamental right, but a necessary foundation for a peaceful, prosperous, and a sustainable world. And we've seen progress has been made, which is great. Um, but there's also so many challenges that exist from discriminatory laws, social and cultural norms, and a lot of underrepresentation of leadership and different things of physical and sexual violence that still exist today. Um, COVID has unfortunately exacerbated a lot of these issues and could reverse some of the progress. So today, I'm really fortunate to, and I'm smiling as I look around these the different speakers here, we've got an amazing roundup of speakers from Michelle Kwok, Kasa Slavner, Andrea Remnis, Puranama Ramakrishnan, I think I said it right, and Ella Wang um, to talk about all these issues. So I want you to use the chat bar. Uh, I want to ask everyone and, and to start this with what does gender equality mean to you in one word? You know, if you want to put that in the chat bar, we'll get this going. You know, in one word, what does it mean? Uh, empowerment, challenge, whatever, whatever that comes to you. Uh, we're going to have polls throughout here and, and we're going to just really want this to be interactive and about you. Um, this is definitely not about me. Uh, we want to make this as interactive and fun as possible. So if you could, um, we'll start with Michelle, kind of a quick little 60 second intro and, and that, then we'll go around and then we'll jump into some of the questions. So Michelle, if you want to give us a little background about yourself and, and just touch on uh, quickly kind of what, what SDG5 means to you and then we'll go around the horn. Cool, yeah. Uh, I mean, you'll soon know that everything that I do really revolves around SDG5. So I am the co-founder and CEO of Flick. We are a platforming community hub that connects female founders and leaders with students from across the world through meaningful apprenticeships. So founders are able to get helping hands on their businesses. Like I said before, all of, well, before we went live, female founders are so notoriously under-resourced. Um, actually, I've Morgan Stanley found that women-focused businesses are capitalized 80% less than businesses overall. And there's a ton of other data around that that we can talk about today. Um, and students on our platform are also able to gain career relevant experience, skills, training, mentorship with established female leaders, and also break into male dominated industries. Our goal is, and our mission is really to advance women's economic participation and accelerate women led ventures globally. Awesome. Andrea? 
Hi everyone, my name is Andrea Remes. I'm half French, half Mexican. I'm also co-founder and CEO of the edtech platform called Erandi Aprende. This is a platform that aims to encourage young girls to start from an early age to get interested in science and technology to be able to bridge the gender gap in that area because it's still one of those realms that is still highly divided and we want to encourage them to never give up, always dream big and go for it. Love it. Pure Nima. Hello everybody, I'm Purnima from India. Uh, I'm a Heartfulness trainer and I host the GLOW webinars for the Heartfulness Institute. GLOW is an acronym for Genuine Loving Outstanding Women and it's a webinar-based chat show to help women bring balance and harmony in all the various different roles they play in today's society. And uh, we achieve this by inviting women who are experts in various fields, who are influencers and change makers. And uh, we talk about what uh, we talk about the sustainable development goals of the United Nations from the perspective of each of their uh, area of interest. So we have conducted more than 50 such webinars and uh, GLOW's webinar is to empower women and connect with them uh, from the face of the heart and to compassionately empower them. So that's me. Thanks, Purnima. Kasha? Hi, everyone. I'm Kasha Slavner. Um, I'm a documentary filmmaker and the founder of the Global Sunrise Project, which is a media organization focused on solution-based narratives, um, highlighting the important work of uh, grassroots organizers. Um, and so we create media that um, is inspirational, but also um, motivates people to take action through um, our paired workshops on SDG education for youth. Um, and we are working in multiple formats, so film, photography, and uh, social media outreach. Great, thank you. And Elle? Hi everyone, hello from New York City. Um, I'm a partnerships advisor at the United Nations in New York. And you know, during my time, I witnessed how we transitioned from MDGs to all 17 SDGs. And uh, you know, to us, SDG five being a separate goal sometimes can be a little weird because it's really integral to all the other SDGs that we talk about. Without gender equality, we really can achieve the other um, SDGs. So to us, it's imperative. It's non-negotiable fundamental right to all women um, out there. And uh, you know, during my time um, at the UN, I've been involved in a lot of the sustainability um, advisory for startups, uh, corporations, and uh, companies. And uh, um, I look forward to engaging with you all today to see how we can really um, see gender mainstreaming and gender equality in all the work that we do. Thanks. Thank you so much. And again, it's I, I have a smile on my face looking at all five of you. You you all have such a unique, amazing perspective. And the goal of this is to have just sort of organized pandemonium. I've got some questions, but if if you are in the audience, you've got a question, ask it. This is this is your opportunity. You've got some really amazing speakers here. So I'm gonna start uh, just sort of a general question about sort of from your perspective and the work that you've done, but what are some barriers to entry around gender equality within your perspective workplace and and maybe some personal insights that you've experienced and Michelle if you could take it I know you mentioned just on access to capital and that but from within your perspective and your industries and what you've seen what are some barriers and and what are some challenges to that you've seen personally and and some insights on that yeah I definitely um the, the funny thing is I grew up going to an all-girls school from grade one to twelve so I didn't know really what it was like to feel barriers, I guess, because when we were in grade one to 12 and you're in an all girls environment, everybody's like empowering you all the time. They're like, you can do anything that you want. You can be prime minister. You can do this. You can do that. You can like start, you can, you can start a global movement. Uh, and then I went to university and for the first time in university, I went to a co-ed school. And that was the first time in my life. I was like, I first time I moved out of my house, um, first time I wasn't with my family anymore, I went to co-ed school. And going there, that was the first time I think I in, really encountered like microaggressions. Um, I considered myself like a really top student and, and I was doing really well in my program. But for example, when we were in group situations and it was like a seven to eight people in a group, um, and most of them are guys, I, I did a STEM degree and most of them are guys. And I would be like, oh, I'd, I'd love to lead the project or that was not okay with them. And, and uh, they always wanted to take the lead even though it was so disorganized. 
Uh, and so I think I started realizing the barriers are more societal norms that are put into place where everyone, even when the group started, everyone started looking to the guys to be like, okay, so what should we be doing? What is everyone's role here? Uh, and, and you start to really, really notice that everyone looks up to basically the tallest, the biggest guy there for guidance and for leadership. Um, and it's all based on like looks or it's all based on what you think the gender norm should be that, and, and all the girls would be totally okay with taking direct orders from the guys, but not necessarily from the girls either. So I think there's a lot of, a lot of the barriers have been put in place by a lot of like historical, um, historical action that has just been, that has just been affirmed over time. Um, and especially when I entered entrepreneurship, I immediately saw the gender disparity. I went to this, I got into this program called Next 36, it's one of the top entrepreneurship programs in Canada. And yes, le yet less than 18% of our cohort were women. There weren't a ton of female founder mentors that were available to us. And that's kind of why we started Flick in the first place is we, uh, we would ask some of the people, we were like, hey, we'd love to find female founder mentors. I'd al I also really wanted to find somebody who resonated with, with my identity. I found that I didn't think that I could be an entrepreneur when I grew up because when I was younger, because I didn't see anybody who was like an Asian woman who was leading a tech company. When I was thinking of entrepreneurs, I watched like the social network and I was like, oh, Mark Zuckerberg. I don't look like Mark Zuckerberg. Like I don't, I, I don't, I don't do tech. Like I'm not a technical founder. Uh, I don't look like him. I, I don't talk like him. And same thing in this program. I actually had a huge mental breakdown in the middle of the program because I was like, I don't talk like anybody here. All of these guys are like, spewing out that they're gonna start billion dollar companies we're all like 19 or like 20 <laughs> and and they're like I don't want to touch a company unless it's a billion dollar company and I'm like I want to do something in social impact um and honestly we were we were looked down upon because people would be, really be like why would you want to do something in social impact that's not going to make any money uh, and I was like I don't think I'm really in entrepreneurship to make a billion dollars right now I kind of just want to I want to start a company that where I can direct change and direct positive change um, and I felt like I and again those like gender societal norms kind of made me feel like I didn't belong even though I was there I had earned my place in this in this like prestigious program I literally had a mental breakdown on my birthday and I was like I don't think I belong here I think I should go home Nobody else like talks the way that I do. Nobody else believes in what I believe in. Uh, I don't even want to start a billion dollar company. Like I don't think this is what I what I want to do for the rest of my life. So, yeah, just to just to sum that up, it's just I I do think that there's a lot of work to be done in in terms of letting women have the floor and normalizing that you know we 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 do think differently from one another, but we also need to have mentors in the space that we can look up to that resonate with exactly what we're talking about. And it's tough to find, it's tough to, uh, to reach equity without those, without those mentors and role models that you can look up to and be like, oh, that person looks exactly like me, that person talks like me. And um, I, I think that I can be her one day. Well said, anyone else have any thoughts or comments on that? Yeah. Um Coming from Mexico, I mean, this is a huge issue going on here. And it has to do a lot with what Michelle said is social cultural norms, but it's mainly education. I mean, I come from the north of Mexico and their roles are really pre-established as women are meant to get stay at home, raise the kids. And the idea is you might go to university. Okay, now that's a given thing. But after you finish university, you're supposed to get married. And there's still this idea that if you are 25 and older and are not married, you're going to like be left on the shelf. So it's really hard, especially to like change that mentality in people and tell them, well, things are changing. We need to change as well. And there's a lot of given things, uh, especially saying what type of careers you're supposed to do or not to do. That's why I started what I'm doing, because in my country, not even 20% of people who represent the workforce in science and technology areas are women. And that's because girls are taught from a really early age that they're not capable of doing science, that that's the guy's thing, that they shouldn't be doing that. So if you actually start from an early stage teaching them that that's not true, that they're as capable, if not more capable than men at doing this type of stuff, 
well, we're never going to be able to make that progress and be able to bridge that gap. So I think a lot has to be done actually on education and education levels from primary level to really teach people that they're capable of doing stuff and that um, gender roles are actually flexible. It's not because you're a guy or a girl that you're not meant or not meant to do something, so. Well said. Yeah, if I may just to add one more Please. thing, I think just from the public policy background, a lot of communities, countries, they're still facing barriers from the policy making perspective. When you discriminate women, married women, or you know women with children, but uh, there's no policy in place to pr protect your rights, you know, in pursuing your career. Um, we still have a lot of uh, interviewers in some countries, they ask you, are you married? Do you plan to have children within the next two years? Um, this is unthinkable in, you know, in the United States, for example, but uh, it happens so often in, uh, elsewhere in the world. And that is really the policy challenge that we have to really communicate with the policymakers in those places and uh, put the right uh, framework uh, in place to, to protect women and l that, that might bring comes to the kind of next question where from a policy standpoint why why is it important to include females and just this this idea of gender equality when creating and implementing programs and i, I know that that applies for business that applies for nonprofits and especially from a policy standpoint so just g give a little more deep dive into that if you can yeah, um, I must confess, you know, until uh, the recent years when I actually had the opportunity to travel to a lot of the countries where UN and the donor countries implemented programs, I never realized how important for us to uh, include the gender sensitive components into a lot of the projects and uh, programs. For example, when we went to Uganda and we uh, toured a lot of the maternally health centers, which were amazing uh, work that were done by a lot of the countries and uh, agencies. But one thing we noticed was, you know, for example, the birthing center they didn't have bathroom within the center itself. Women have to walk five minutes away to a dark area to go to the bathroom. We talk about the golden hour after women give birth, but how do they and the infants, you know, maintain their sanity, like the sanitary um, safety, if they don't have access to shower and a bathroom within the birthing center. Of course, you know, when we raised that with the donor countries, they realized, oh, you know, this is something that maybe during the design process, they didn't think about that, or maybe due to like the local constraints or something. So um, that is like one example that, uh, you know, really like struck me, you know, as a mother and how important it is from the beginning when we do the architectural like design, we have to consider what you know, women actually would need in these sort of uh, programs. And also another uh, example that we witnessed in many countries is um, you know, we spend a lot of money building schools, but uh, you will be surprised to see how many schools don't have separate boy toilet and a girl toilet, and just how many places don't have access to um, you know, sanitary waters and uh, these are the number one reasons for girls to drop out of school when they hit the age when they started to have periods because you know there's no way to help them to uh, remain in school when they go through that uh, change without uh, the act the necessary access to all these facilities and the water. Um, when we talk about, you know, women entrepreneurship who, who want to go to the markets in certain areas, if you experience like sexual harassment during public transportation, how do you continue to go to the market to, you know, have your business if uh, your own safety cannot be guaranteed? So all these programs and projects that we have identified worldwide that lack certain gender sensitive design that put in place you know they're not they're not going to be sustainable because women and girls are not going to continue to go through that if they don't have the basic you know safety um, that can be guaranteed so that's why it's very very important that uh, you know now we talk to everyone who wants to implement a new project a new program to absolutely consider from the female perspective, you know, these gender sensitive infrastructure, gender sensitive um, like components that are in, uh, included in the design process. And, and Kasha, maybe if you can elaborate on this a little bit more about why it is so important to have the, the female perspective from the design of a policy or a program. Um, what, are your, what are your thoughts on that? 
Sure. So um, currently my, woke, my work is focused on the intersection between peace and climate. Um, so that's what my next film is um, looking into. And one thing that I've learned in my years of peace advocacy is that women are disproportionately affected by conflict, but also seriously underrepresented at decision making tables about uh, conflict and peace building. Um, and there's a statistic that says when women and girls are included in the peace building process, peace is 35% more likely to last 15 years or more. So traditional power holders in this space are men. Um, and when men are at the table, often their approach is to look at military action um, versus when you include women in the peace building process, they're more likely to focus on economic recovery, education, or uh, legal reform, which creates a higher long-term resilience to the after effects of conflict. Um, so something that I'm also learning a lot about is um, the core principles of a feminist foreign policy. Um, so that promotes demilitarization and nonviolent conflict resolution, as well as taking an intersectional and equitable approach to policy, which is not my area of focus in terms of my work, but it's highly influential to um, the way that we, you know, that we govern our societies and women should be at the forefront of decisions um, about their own lives and their own bodies and their own experiences. So um, I guess that that's what I can contribute. Thanks so much. Any other thoughts on that or questions, insights? There's one thing I'll add from this book that I'm reading. I don't know if you've all read the book, Invisible Woman. I literally just started it. And it's so interesting um, to when they when you start the book and it talks a lot about language, it's like that, that integrates into the policy and the programs, the way that language is used. It's always in the generic masculine. So we always use like, if you say man, it's supposed to mean human and it's supposed to include both women and men. But um, women tend to think that they literally just mean man. So for example, uh, if a program is written with the generic masculine term, then a woman is 80% less likely to apply for that than a man is. Uh, so in terms of writing policies and programs that are more female focused, that's super, super important and also including those actually female focused terms is really, really important because you might actually already when you're building the program, even if you have both women and men in mind, you might already be discriminating against women in a mental way. Yeah, that's all I wanted to add. That's fascinating. And I, I've seen you type the word W-O-M-X-N. And I remember it seems like, was that a typo? But I could um, just quickly give give a little more insight on, that, on what that is and what that means um, for the clarity on that. Yeah, so this is actually something I learned too because we, we were talking with a lot of LGBTQ women, um, LG, LGBTQ folks, and they were all uh, talking about how important language is. Uh, and, I, and I think this is something that is still being discussed as well, but after speaking to a few LGBTQ groups, we realized that um, using women can also be more inclusive because it includes both trans women and non-binary women. Um, and so that's why we use the W-O-M-X-N instead of being the exact uh, opposite of man. So it's not like woman, then it's women with an X. Thank you for that. So. I mentioned earlier, this is the SDG talks and we cover all the SDGs, uh, you know, from one to 17, you see on the shoulder from good health and well-being, zero hunger, poverty, inequalities, life below water, life above water. Um, Pure Nima, I know you do a lot of work across all the SDGs. I apologize, I think I got, got a siren outside. You do work across all the SDGs, but give us a little insight on, you know, SDG 5, we're talking about, but how does SDG 5 touch uh, health, education, water, access, you know, access to water. Give us a little snippet in all the intersections there. So, uh, you know, the sustainable development goals, these 17 goals, um, SDG one is eradicating poverty and two is zero hunger. And, you know, how can one and two uh, be different because poverty and hunger are closely related. And then when you look at SDG three, which is good health and well-being, it is again directly related to one and two again. And moving on, we have SDG 4, quality education, SDG 5, gender equality. And how can you think about education when you're, when, when, when you're still hungry, when you're in poverty? 
and domestic abuse is another thing which is which is uh, there in a lot of countries it's it's still and um, just recently andrea said about uh, you know how in mexico city we have uh, these like if you're if you're 25 and you're still not married i mean it's there in india too and i was i was like wondering how um, similar our cultures are in that respect so when you look at all of these issues um, how can i think about getting a higher education when i have to balance a relationship when i have to uh, i mean it's all possible but it's not easy it's not simple but it's 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 valid only for a woman it's not the same for a man for a man so unless we educate our little girls how can we make them feel empowered enabled and how can we educate our women to acquire higher skills wiser skills and then like where, from where do we get balance joy harmony and peace when i am not at peace i mean when when somebody in africa is not at peace when somebody in mexico is not at peace and when they are in hunger when they cannot feed their children how can somebody else in the other corner of the world be at peace and that's exactly why we are having these webinars right to talk about these issues because we are not at peace we we are concerned about all the other people across the world and we are worried about all the other sdgs so i mean these are absolutely related to each other and it's it's very much interlinked and one leads to the other and so on until the 17th sdg which is the most important and um, strong global partnerships and cooperation so gender equality intersects with all of these sdgs and all sdgs intersects with intersects with all other sdgs and women are like half the population of the world theoretically and we shouldn't even be ha even having to talk about it the next month is international day of women and we are going to have a glow webinar on inspiring women and how to celebrate the women who have performed in today's world like we have people like rosa parks we have our vice president uh, kamala harris and we have we have so many inspiring people who have who have really contributed and and why are we holding this webinar next month and why are we having an international day of women because we want to encourage celebrate womanhood to encourage women to be to encourage women to be more comfortable being women so gender equality is something which intersects with everything in the world just not the other sdgs so uh, so i mean like that's my answer uh, that's my response to you that gender in, gender equality or gender inequality rather i should say intersects with all the other sdgs and uh, to find peace balance is the most important thing for us to incorporate all the other sdgs at a single day so yes any other thoughts on that intersection between SDG 5 and, and how it intersects with all the other aspects of growth, life, development? Yeah, I would say, uh, as everybody has mentioned, it, it's intertwined. Everything goes together, goes hand in hand. But more than anything, uh, yes, women represent half of the world's population. And still, we're uh, a gr vulnerable group. We're affected the most. A woman in certain areas of the world have least access to stuff just because they were born a woman. So that's the thing. Uh, one needs to fight for equality because if you put it just on numbers or economical terms, well, if you want everybody to thrive, you need to start with women in order to to have all of that equality and be make sure that everybody is doing well and thrives and is able to go to school, is able to get a better job opportunity, so on and so forth. So. It, that's where it starts. It's just saying we're equal. We need to go there and get there. Can I, I would also love to add to this. Um, I think that both my co-panelists have really described how important it is to look at um, gender equality and the SDGs through an intersectional lens. And, you know, when we are working towards achieving gender equality, we are simultaneously working towards achieving all of the other SDGs. Um, so I think it all really works together. For example, like with climate change, in areas where gender inequality is high, you also see higher measures of environmental degradation and air pollution and, you know, forest depletion. So, you know, when you work on climate change, you should also focus on how climate change affects women and girls um, or indigenous communities. Like we can't, we're working with all of these systems as, as if it's like one human body, you can't have it. Like you can't just focus on, you know, the hand doesn't work without the arm. Like you have to, you have to look at the bigger picture. You have to make sure that you're including multiple perspectives. So I hope that made sense. Yeah, very much so. Um, so I think I want to get a little bit more even even personal if, if possible. I mean, I think 
you all have had your own stories throughout your life that got you to here. Um, but maybe Elle, if you want to give this of any sort of like lived personal experiences of of some of the aspects of things that you've experienced challenges to overcoming this gender equality and, and you know what are where do some of these gender imbalances still exist and, and just paint a little picture on on what that looks like from your perspective and what it looks like and then of course everyone else continue to feel free to, to chime in uh, yes, so um, this is obviously a very personal, very recent, uh, which is, you know, what I experienced during the global pandemic, uh, just uh, working from home as uh, a woman and mom and how it became very evident that uh, the different uh, uh, roles in the, in the household between me and my husband were just uh, like, you know, surfacing before we even realized it. Because before, when we all went to the workplaces, uh, no one really realized, you know, how much uh, chores or like groceries and uh, childcare, um, those were sort of like subdued because, you know, the child goes to the daycare. But when both parents work from home, it just took us a few months to realize how everything automatically, um, you know, how I as the mom automatically assume a lot of the responsibilities without everyone, anyone asking me. And uh, until a couple of months later, I realized, well, wait a minute, like, how come, you know, I had to do all the grocery shopping. I had to, you know, drop my meetings if, you know, uh, my son is not napping, but my husband continues with his meetings. Or, you know, if I have to, you know, take more personal days and, uh, um, you know, he, even though the company offers them one day a week for childcare, but, uh, you know, it, it was very rare for him to take it. So I think, you know, we have read a lot of the articles and the numbers of how, um, so many working moms dropped out of the work, work, workforce in 2020 and the number is just continuing. And even you know, for women entrepreneurship, I think there's a study recently um, launched these couple of days showing even for female entrepreneurship, uh, women just to continue to um, have more sort of like additional like sort of um, concerns either with childcare or, or, or like taking care of the elderly uh, during their entrepreneurship journey compared to men. So, um, you know, this is just a, something um, new to me personally, and I feel very, very strongly about how all the other working moms are experiencing. And I don't know how many, you know, are in the audience who can relate to that as well. And I look forward to hearing all of you who, um, how you think. Yeah, I can, I, I, I mean, I'm not a mom, but <laughs> that, that I've definitely heard a lot of that from our mompreneurs that are in our community. Um, something that I have personally uh, gone through throughout building a female focused business has always been like, why is this going to work? This is only serving 50% of the population. Actually, when we first started the company and we were trying to open a bank account, our small business advisor who was supposed to be opening our bank account spent an hour telling us why it was not, why our company wasn't going to work. And he was like, I just don't think that, I just don't think it's a smart idea. You want to, you want to build this company and like, maybe you should do this for men. He literally said that. He was like, maybe you should do this for men and it'll work. And I was like, what? And the amount of times that that has happened to us at the beginning almost made us not want to start the company because all of these like experts in the space, like they were all guys, all these experts in the space were like, oh, like the female founder market size, I don't know any female founders, so it must be like really small and uh, you're not gonna be able to find them. And I was like, isn't that the problem though? Like, don't you hear that that's literally the problem? But they're like, but then it's not a billion dollar opportunity. And I'm going back and I'm like, I'm trying to tell you that I'm not trying to create a billion dollar company, I'm trying to, accelerate more women through the female founder pipeline. That is the goal of the company. And they're like, oh, it's not gonna work. It only serves 50% of the population. So maybe you should just open it up. And that's the thing is that we, we can't reach equity if women don't have the same amount of resources or don't have dedicated resources, dedicated funding in order to get to equity. Like a lot of us know that uh, female founders, I think last year or the year before, it, we raised three per, less than 3% of VC funding. I think it was like 2.9% of VC funding and women of color raised 0.25%, I think of the VC funding. And uh, that's like normalized in VC. That's a normal thing. And I think even this year, I think only like 52 Latinos, ra Latinas raised uh, VC funding. That's like, I can count that, you know, it'll take me like 52 seconds to count to 52. 
Uh, so it's, it's really, really crazy to see that it is normalized to not create women focused businesses. That's, uh, and, and like in, in societal conversations, when you're talking to people, they, they even look down on you when you are creating women focused businesses, which is even enlarging the gender gap. So uh, I, I think I've had so many conversations that revolve around just that point, which is making us not want to create more women focused businesses, which is leaving women even, which is creating the disparity even larger. And yeah, I don't know if anyone else has similar experiences to that. Yeah, you just made me think, uh, Michelle, about this personal anecdote of uh, the mom of one of my best friends from high school. She was the first woman to lead a bank here in Mexico. Um, she was the first woman to lead Scotia Bank here. And it's a very simple anecdote related to something Elle mentioned earlier, bathrooms. She arrived to the first meeting as the new uh, director of the bank. And then she simply asked, where's the ladies room? The man just said like, it should be there. It's like, of course not. Because beforehand, there was no other woman who attended a board meeting there. So it's just one of those tiny things that sparks the idea of how much work needs to be done. And there are certain sectors, just finance, corporate, and big, big uh, positions where women are not there uh, easily. They don't get there easily because of this pre-established roles we have in mind. So as I mentioned beforehand, it has a lot to do with teaching young girls from an early age. And I see, I saw some of the questions from the public. When you live in this um, patriarchal society, what can you do to like avoid uh, teaching and reproducing these patterns? Well, you start from a really young age telling them, this is how it works. This shouldn't be this way. And well, you might see and notice that other people are gonna do otherwise, but you shouldn't be doing this. And, also try to like motivate your kids, your children, your, I don't know, nephews or other relatives to also try to reproduce those positive attitudes in order to be able to start like moving this negative change and make it something a positive. To that point, the question from Kanva Sangam, thank you for that. Uh, Piranima, I know you're, you're leading these webinars and you already do a lot of stuff. And you, one point I loved you said of making women comfortable being women. Uh, and how I, to that point of the question of how do we ensure that these new generations aren't influenced on why a woman can't do this or why a man has to do that? Uh, what are your thoughts on how we educate and, and break down some of those different barriers and norms? So like a um, few of my panelists said, education is truly important and uh, we need to support each and each other. We need to collaborate. We need to show more love and understanding though those words sound very cheesy, but in reality, we need to actually show that empathy, show that compassion, and which is basically love. I mean, how you might probably think, how can I love a stranger? But that's exactly what it is. You know, if you don't have love for humanity, then there is nothing worth even speaking about, you know? So uh, for me, on a, I can tell you on a personal level, uh, you know, what we do in this community. So uh, on the GLOW webinars, we have we teach heartfulness meditation. And in this common community space, we have an everyday regime of meditation. We learn to regulate our mind. We have made a difference to our individual selves, to our personal communities. And when we invite uh, expert speakers to speak about different SDGs, it makes more sense because our hearts and minds are actually open. And we adopt and work towards achieving every single SDGs because now we have the capacities in our heart and we have this capacity to manifest it big time because sometimes it's not easy, you know, like it's not easy uh, to be aware of everything. Like Andrea said, where's the woman's room? Where's the lady's room? I mean, I never, if I was a man, I would never have thought about it because there has never been a woman. And I can't really blame that guy, blame that organization because we haven't really thought about it and it's okay. Well, all, all I mean is it's okay. But Keep your hearts open and when the time for change comes be open and receptive to it and then say maybe sorry we need to get it done you know and then get it done that's all a woman probably asks she doesn't want to pick up a fight she just wants to go to the loom man i mean it's as simple as that so so the point is it's okay that we were like this it's okay that everything has been like this i mean i'm not trying to justify what was before all that i'm saying is right now the moment is now and now, if you have to keep your hearts open 
to regulate your thoughts, regulate your mind, have some love for humanity and have this joy for each other. Like I'm happy if Michelle is successful in her profession and she must also be happy if I am and vice versa for all the panelists and all the participants. So this mutual, mutual opening of hearts and mutual collective evolution or this collective collaboration, which is again, you know, the last SDG, SDG, uh, which is a partnership for, is gender equality a concern for men? And 73% have answered yes. And there are 27% who have answered no. So, I mean, gender equality is not a concern for man. I mean, 27% of the current participants have answered no. I mean, that's a shock to me. I, 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 I mean, like, I mean, gender, <laughs> there are only two genders and there are other genders. I don't try to mean that in a political way, but, but there is only one humanity and we can't be, uh, there is nothing apolitical or political about it. So what I'm trying to say is from a, 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 from a singular perspective of what I can do, I can, I can keep my heart open. I can show love. I can show compassion. So I, I don't have to know all the answers and I don't need to know, um, uh, I, need, I don't need to have all the knowledge, but I can be open when it is actually shown to me, when it is shared to me. I can apologize for any mistake which I have made and I can move forward. So, so what I feel is we should be more, uh, you know, open and more compassionate to ourselves and to others. I love it. And everyone else, I'd love you to continue to expand and riff on that of what, what can be done. I mean, what, of course, we don't, we can all look back and, you know, point fingers and say, you know, WTF this, WTF that, like we know there's things that have been wrong, but you all have interesting insights of what, what, what can be done? What are some examples of some best practices and use cases that we're seeing today that are working and things to, to dig deep on and, and expand upon? Uh, Andrea, L, Kasha, Michelle, any, you want to go with that? Kasha, if you want to start, maybe. <laughs> I guess my best, my best experience that I can speak about is, you know, where I'm working right now is, is the fact that we don't, we have a shocking disparity in the film industry. You know, 20% of all directors, writers, producers, and cinematographers working in the top 100 films were women. And that's still 80%, you know, that's, we're not even close to equality in terms of that space. Um, and I think that, you know, I think that providing more access to opportunities for women, like a lot of these, a lot of my co-panelists are doing is highly important and, you know, creating space for women to, to create and to engage in meaningful work for them. Like that access to opportunity is really vital and we're not seeing that equality in terms of access to opportunity provided. Um, for women in the film industry in particular, uh, mentorship uh, from women, women to women filmmakers. Um, so I think that that's one place to start. Um, and yeah, I think I'll, I'll leave it at that because I'm, I'm really curious Thanks. what my co-panelists will say. Oh. I may add here, um, so, you know, when we talk about gender equality, it's almost too much of a pressure to set any goals to really, you know, achieve a true gender equality because um, for a lot of the workplaces, they may instead use the word gender parity. So, you know, that seems to be like a more feasible first step to achieve. Um, but, you know, when we look at um, even places where they say, okay, we are on our way to achieve 50-50% um, you know, gender parity at the workforce. But then if we take a closer look at the position levels, you know, seniorities, uh, pay, pay amount, um, you know, the number is still like far from what we would, you know, strive for in terms of gender equality. So I think, um, you know, it's very, very important. Again, like I feel for all, all of us, uh, wherever we work at or in our own companies or companies we work for to really, um, you know, like start the conversation and make sure that so we don't really switch concepts and we don't just stop at uh, you know like certain level of achievements but uh, we really keep our eyes on you know the big picture which is like true equality if we still have men and women get paid at different amount or if we just try to recruit more junior females to like run up the numbers then we are still nowhere near like what we need to be so these conversations just need to be you know brutally honest and uh, keep everyone who's in position to make such changes, you know, really um, in checks. May I also add one more thing? 
Um, so a big part of um, creating equality in the workplace, I think, is also making sure that our workplaces are safe for women. Um, so the film industry is is a big, is a it's really well known, of course, we had the Me Too scandal for having sexual violence against women. So we need to ensure that women feel safe uh, reporting those experiences and that men are held to account for their actions. Um, so that the power dynamics are not abused in these circumstances. So um, I think that that's also a good place to start is that to make sure that we are constantly evaluating how we're allies to the women in our lives um, when we're working with them or you know just hearing their experiences. Um, so, yeah, I would conclude. Andrea or Michelle, you want to give context there? Yeah, just uh, bring, no, go. Go, go first. Okay, no worries. Um, yeah, just bring it on again. Something that uh, Kasha just mentioned is it's really, really important. It's safety for women. Uh, another reason why a uh, female in a certain uh, area or um, yeah, job, it, specifically it's because they don't feel safe or comfortable being around so many men. And I understand that it's hard to be, you know, like different or not feel at ease with someone. But if you don't start setting an example at the same time, well, you're also contributing to keeping that status quo. So by motivating more people to also join and do something different, you're inspiring others to do that same thing. So that's what I would say. Yeah, on a very similar train uh, of thought, uh, like I was talking about with the VC funding, um, the reason why a lot of women also don't get funded is because a lot of women also want to start women-focused businesses and then they're pitching VCs who aren't women who have never felt those pain points before. And if the VCs don't understand those pain points, then they're like, oh, it's not really worth anything. It's not a billion dollar opportunity. You're, I hate when you say that. <laughs> you hear that all the time. Oh, it's not a billion dollar opportunity, but it's because all these VCs who are at the table who are making all the decisions don't feel the pain points and don't, don't realize that even in a capitalistic sense, like we're not even talking about social, um, social justice issues, like in a capitalistic sense, you're leaving, I, I think uh, Jesse Draper, if anyone's uh, read her piece on investing in women is an effing charity. She writes that we're leaving like a $3 trillion opportunity on the table because women focused businesses aren't being capitalized and women are, uh, women are now struggling with certain issues because there aren't companies that are fixing those pain points and those companies aren't being capitalized. So. Uh, we need to bring more women to the table. I know there are like venture fellow programs and that's a really, really great way to get women started in VC. But more, more and more I've heard from, because I also work with a ton of female students who are also venture fellows in those programs. They are kind of scared out of those, uh, those industries because everybody who's above them is, a guy and doesn't understand what they need and doesn't understand how they should be communicated to and doesn't understand that they need to shift the way that they communicate to younger women or offer them guidance um, and like harassment shouldn't be like a workplace thing and so they're scared out of all of these all of these programs so even though there might be 50 50 women in these venture fellow programs when you get all the way to the top people have been dropping out because they don't see anybody there that that looks like them, all their mentors are guys that don't know how to communicate with them. Um, so in order to also have gender parity everywhere, you need to be able to bring women to the top and be like, you deserve to be here. And you also need to be that role model to support all of these younger women who are trying to get break into these industries. There's this one story that really, really got me. One of these, one of the apprentices that joined our platform uh she's a she's a woman of color she was in tech she's like super passionate about tech loves tech she's like i want i always wanted to get into tech i always wanted to create something that was tech enabled scalable and so i joined this company and i i think i was like one of two women there and her experience in tech she was like it was really cool but um but whenever i would whenever i would pitch an idea they would tell me no you're not here to pitch ideas you're here to do the work that we're telling you to do uh, and then, and she was telling me about her stories of how her manager 
pretty much refused to connect her with anybody else, was jealous when, when she would do something that was amazing and then take credit for it himself. And she thought that that was the norm in tech. She was like, oh, that's just the way that it is. You just like pay your dues and then, and then you'll get, you'll find your way up. And uh, when she was an apprentice with us and she, she ended up connecting with a founder who was running a cryptocurrency, a, a crypto, some sort of crypto firm. <laughs> I, I don't really know anything about crypto, <laughs> but she was connecting with a founder who was working in crypto tech. And she, and, and then she called me right after she met with the founder and she was like, this is crazy. This is the first time anybody has asked me what I want to do. This is the first any, this is the first time anybody has asked me about, about, um, feedback on their product and she took it and she put it in her product and she was so excited and she was so and and that was like so crazy to me because I was like that should be the norm you know you shouldn't be looked down upon because because of the color of your skin because of your gender and she was like well I thought that that was just the way tech worked was that you just do what other people tell you to do you're not allowed to pitch ideas and you're not allowed to meet with mentors in the space and your manager takes all the credit for whatever you're doing and I was like that's crazy that's the way that a ton of women in tech view tech and that's why they leave so early um and so now she she ended up getting a full-time job with this uh with this crypto founder and I think she's on the founding team of this um of this founder's company but it, without this platform without this place where she could have found a role model, somebody that she could have pitched ideas to and somebody who was super open to her feedback and was like, she, she never, she never would have changed her mind about tech. She never would have stayed in the, stayed in the industry. So we actually have someone who's raised their hand. You know, I've actually never allowed someone to talk from the webinar, but Simone, Simone, I've seen you've asked a question. I'm just going to press a lot of talk and see what happens and would love for you to ask your question and, and get part of the conversation. All right, Simone, you are, you okay. don't have to put your camera. Can you hear us? Yeah, yeah, listen, yeah, I'm trying. You, you don't wait, have to put your wait. camera on, that's fine. If you want to just uh, ask your question, that's, that's I fine think, too. Well, I'm trying to put my camera on, but I don't, beyond okay. I'm on my iPhone, sorry. No problem. Um, but you can hear me. Yes, we can hear you. Okay, now what, what strikes me, I have been the head of the gender department in the Dutch Ministry of Foreign Affairs. I've always been working on gender-related issues. I'm now working on leadership for SDGs, and uh, this is always, of course, about also gender uh, uh, relations between in, uh, as to leadership. What strikes me is that we are getting around in circles all the time, because if, if I listen to this conversation, we could have had this conversation like 20 years ago. Of course, to a certain extent, you see lots of inspirational and wonderful um, uh, initiatives at practical level, but basically the underlying uh, um, issues this, uh, are not being solved. We need systemic change and not just change, no people fighting for that change bottom up only. We also need like really inspirational uh, um, uh, results-oriented leadership from the top. I don't see it. We see more authoritarian regimes now. We see anti-democratic movements, populism, all kinds of stuff. I think there is a real issue in terms of the lack of government leadership, no walking the talk there. So I have seen tens of thousand people uh, gathering in New York every single year for the UN uh, uh, Commission on Status of Women, all kinds of different uh, meetings. But I don't seem to see real um, progress, uh, and especially in the countries that need it. I, I would really love to hear your perspective on this. Thanks. Anyone want to, want to take it for a stab at that? L, Michelle, Kasha, Andrea. Oh, yeah. I would say, uh, yeah, you go first, L, please. Um, yeah, Simone, I, you know, I go through the Commission of Status Women every year. 
um, you know, just to seeing tens of thousands of women coming to New York. Um, and uh, I've heard, you know, just uh, with my own ears, how many representatives from many countries, they raise uh, the gender sensitive infrastructure, for example, um, during the general debate. And, um, you know, just uh, as a like tiny drop in the ocean in this whole, um, whole world, it's just, you know, we, I, I mean, I share your frustration. I share your um, eagerness to see like faster change and just see how these voices, you know, that have been expressed uh, um, at all these uh, relevant forums to be really taken into consideration and actually being implemented at the national level or even at the community level for for many occasions. Um, I, I, you know, as I answered your question uh, in writing, you know, at least. Um, it's been decades, I, I, de I definitely share that. But, uh, you know, there are positive changes that, uh, you know, you also acknowledged uh, the, the new projects, uh, the new in, in initiatives. And the reason we set a 2030 agenda, like all these goals we aim to achieve by 2030. Yeah. And uh, um, it, sometimes it does take time, longer time than we all hope. And uh, um, I think, you know, just uh, having these conversations, even just uh, over and over again to reinforce these points and uh, to make sure they are, they are heard um, like over time by the right people who are making these decisions um, do make a change, um, even at um, a smaller level. So I do hope that, you know, uh, these sort of conversations that Kevin is hosting can be also replicated at other uh, platforms in other countries and uh, with more people like us, you know, who really share this um, passion for, for change. Tasha? I would also like to add, I. I regularly attend the Commission on the Status of Women, and I think that it's a very important forum because we need we need systemic change, yes. We also need those systems and those people in power to be open to listening to the concerns of people who are working on the ground, who know their communities best. Like that's the reason we have resolutions like 1325, UN Resolution 1325 on women, peace, and security, because it was co-drafted with civil society organizers. Um, so I really want to echo that, that that is part of, you know, it's part of the progress and we need leaders at the top to be open to hearing those solutions and admitting that they don't have all the answers and that sometimes, you know, people at the grassroots level um, have really valuable insights to offer. Um, yeah, I also think that a big part of the problem is that we have these systems in place like, you know, trillions of dollars spent on the military every year, um, which, exactly. uphold, it, which uphold those systems of structural violence against women. Um, and if we divested a significant amount from those structures, maybe we would have more money to, like, to give to women-led businesses or to invest in climate resilience, um, which would all ensure gender equality in the long term. So I think that that's also part of the solution. Yeah, and I think also, just so you need from last year, uh, it has been a bit of a black and white situation because on one hand, yes, we have seen that there is a big setback on gender equality. Uh, because of the pandemic, we have been, seen, uh, been able to see that there has been, especially in developing countries, a huge step back. But in other places, uh, it has been the opposite. This year, well, last year, uh, most it was mainly women that won Nobel prizes. Women entered finally Wall Street. We have a new vice president who is a woman. We have we're starting to see like this new role models, and more and more women are actually speaking up and saying things need to change. And I think that that has been one of the positive effects of the pandemic that. Although we have seen setbacks, people are finally raising their voices and are actually trying to make that systemic change. And yes, it's hard, it's gonna take time because we're fighting with something that has been a structure for so much centuries now. And to be able to break that and make those breakthroughs, it's gonna take time. And policies, it's not just making the law, it's making it happen. And to be able to reach those levels, it does take time, sadly. Uh, Andrea, I just would say I love that line. Policy is not just law. Policy is making it happen. In all the SDGs, often you see these 
empty promises where it's, you know, I, I'm taking notes right now. That's no different than just like a policy that with words on paper, uh, unless those words on paper are actually implemented with different carrot and stick type uh, incentives or punishments for not doing stuff and nothing's going to happen. And I think that's, uh, uh, Simone, to your point of how do we see the systemic change? I mean, it's, it's easy to write a policy, but to actually see the change, I mean, even gosh, with the Civil War in America, you know, they, after the Civil War, they basically just changed the, the word of, of what a slave was, you know, and, and then did it really change? I mean, we're, look at where we are today, still going through those kind of issues of the verbiage and terminology and, and all these different social, social justice revolutions. Um, so it's just, I think it's a good point and it's not easy. Um, so just, just a thought there, but it, uh, Pranima or, or uh, Michelle, did you want to add to Simone's point here? You're good. Purnima, anything final there? So, uh, yeah, thank you, um, Kevin. So, uh, you know, extending Simone's question, how long are we going to work for these SDGs or how long are we going to make them or how, how, how difficult or easy is it going to be to make them actually sustainable? Because today uh, we might eliminate poverty from one country and it could crop up in another country after one decade, after, after one century. So, um, so based on the climate change there or other economic policies there or economic problems there. So we have seen this over a period of time in our civilization. As a species, we all have to make the kind of impact where our efforts, efforts are sustainable and we do not have to repeat or replicate the same thing over and over and over in different countries, in genders, in different uh, spaces. And for that to happen, we need to elevate ourselves as a consciousness, which is far beyond and above our current level. Because, uh, you know, like, uh, how do we transcend these problems or challenges which have been created from this level? And uh, do you think the route for climate change or the route for air pollution, route for a uh, root cause for food scarcity, root cause for educational problems are all different? I, I think it is all so similar. It is all the thought pollution which is arising in the environment. How do you re remove greed and avarice from our hearts, the corruption from our hearts? And... Uh, you know, identifying and implementing the methodology to elevate our collective consciousness, to make our hearts pure and simple and identical to nature, mm -hmm. that can be the solution, you know. It's not that, you know, like, how is it that uh, systemic change is just not our goal. The goal is to have a greater good humanity. You know, there was this um, climate change scientist, his name was James um, James Spett, let me read a quote from him. He said, the top environmental problems are selfishness, greed, and apathy. And to deal with these, we need a spiritual and cultural transformation. And we scientists don't know how to do that. So I just read it from this. Uh, I think I read out the same quote in Kevin's SDG. So uh, you see what I mean? It's, it's just not that you, know, you can find a solution for this or that or that need to find the root cause of all the problems and we can't as humanity keep repeating our solutions and as L said and as Andrea said some way somebody is going to listen and we need to have these repeated conversations too so it's just not that we need to look at a larger picture of course we need to do we need to look at you know multiple smaller pictures also so uh, with glow that's what we are trying to do we are trying to teach meditation at least for a small community of women wherein like we try to uplift at least them at least their thought process their consciousness it can cater to they can cater to many different uh, fields, many different areas. So uh, to try to bring about systemic change is, is simple, but it's, it's, it's not complicated. It's very simple because the root cause of everything is the same. It's our hearts and minds. So, uh, you know, that's what we try to do at GLOW for a small community right now. And hopefully it'll, it'll expand. Thanks, Purnima. Simone, do you want to give a final little recap? We, we, I want to be mindful of time. So Simone, just a quick little final thoughts there, and then we're going to move on. Yeah, no, I, I, I totally appreciate, of course, what all of you say. Huh? I mean, I, I see the points. The thing is, it's, if you look at realities on the ground, we see that inequality is on the rise. Uh, Enter-democratic forces on the rise. The UN, where you were going into the issue of the Commission on Stats of Women, there have been hard fights over the past years to uphold the Beijing agenda. Um, so it's, it's not that, that simple, you know, we, we don't get there by just good intentions. And what I always have seen in, the, in New York, for example, during the UNCSW, is that I, I see so, I've seen so many women fighting 
an uphill battle. And in, in, a, in a way, I think we as women have to become more strategic in terms of how to get into the policy arena and, and, and hit the ground running there because uh, as, as someone of you said, you know, at country level, you need basically to implement what has been agreed upon, walk the talk at country level. All those government leaders, they sign up for all those beautiful goals. Um, and then if everybody would do that, the world would look totally different, but they don't. Many don't. And the most difficult SDGs are the most political ones. SDG 5, SDG 10, SDG 16. Because they're politicized. It's about inequality, it's about gender. It's yep. about peace and security, it's about institutions, it's about corruption, it's about power, it's about money. And so that's that's why you know I'm 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 thinking on how to tackle it. I I'm, I I have a start an initiative which I call leadership for SDGs. You can look it up, um, because I think we have to tackle leadership, and nobody really does it. It's strange. Simone. We ask a lot of leaders, but we don't do too much. Sorry, I take too much no, time. No, no, this was great. <laughs> I just want to be mindful. I we kind of trying to wrap her up around the hour, and I want to just kind of give Excuse one last me. final sorry, sorry go around. But no, you. This this kind of remind me of Clubhouse. It's this new app that I'm sure many you've heard that bring people in the conversation. That's what this is all about. Um, you've got some amazing perspectives. I just went on LinkedIn, found your profile, put it in the chat. I saw so, you asking me. <laughs> yeah. So people are going to probably connect with you, but I definitely, I want the, uh, I kind of want to go around the horn one last time. And someone I'm going to, I'm going to lower your hand. So hopefully you don't leave. I'm just, uh, no, I'll be there. Okay. Hopefully I'm just going to go to mute you. Sorry. Um, so just kind of one last kind of go around here and, and everyone, uh, all this, all those speakers and panelists, if you could, Put your link in the in the chat bar in terms of uh, Michelle with with We Are Fleek and Kasha with your webinar uh, with the the Sunrise Project, your Nima with, with everything you're working on. We want to know about it, so please put them in the chat. Um, but kind of one last go around here of everyone. Sort of what what are what is what are one tangible thing that everyday men and women and whomever can do, and and sort of a final thought. So. L, if, if you could start there, um, sort of, again, final thoughts and, and what are one thing that we can all do today and tomorrow as it pertains to advocating and advancing SDG 5? Yes, if I may just uh, include my answer to one of the questions in my roundup. Someone asked Please. how do you talk to your husband about gender roles in the home and how is it affecting you? This actually plays into my sort of last uh, um, thought of the uh, event, which is really to force men into the conversations. If we look around the panel, you know, Kevin, I salute you for starting this conversation, but it usually happens when all the participants are women. <laughs> I mean, it's it happens, uh, you know, at a lot of the events I join, you know, just um, sort of a lack of uh, male representation at conversations like this. Um, you know, we really have to just, uh, you know, force them force them, but not like uh, to join these conversations. I tell my husband playing like, you know, calmly and we have a conversation. I tell him how much more work about the household that I do and I list them. And, uh, you know, thankfully he is very reasonable. He sees my point. He says, right, exactly. You are doing all these extra things about the childcare, about the household chores, about everything. So you have to tell them sometimes, you know, we give them free passes for all, oh, like, you know, they didn't realize, but uh, no, I mean, it's, it's, there, there's no excuse for not realizing anymore, you know, because uh, everyone has their, uh, their job and uh, I have my job and, uh, you know, why it's affecting my job more than it affects, uh, affects him. Let's have a conversation about it and how we can make the change. So really, you know, maybe it's cliche to say speak up, but we do have to speak up to our husbands, partners, uh, colleagues, you know, like um, everyone just to, to have them to join the conversation. Thanks so much. Kasha? I think um, in addition to having those tough conversations with the people, people in our lives, um, continuing to educate ourselves about, you know, we all come from different backgrounds. Um, so we're not experiencing 
we are experiencing a collective gender and experience of gender inequality. But for example, myself as a white woman, I will never compare to the struggles of a woman of color. So educating myself on how to be an ally to the people in my life so that I can advocate for more inclusive, a more inclusive version of gender equality um, is very important. So, um, yeah. Well said, Andrea. Yeah, just following that same line of thought, I would say it's making understand that men are also part of the problem and they're part of the solution. We need to work together to be able to uh, bring this together and find a solution to all of this program and problem. And uh, well, as well, try to be empathetic, try to also show others and educate others to, you know, keep this ripple effect and be able to actually get to those goals that we set to accomplish. Michelle? Yeah, I think one one thing that is like very focused towards entrepreneurs, I always tell everyone is it's, I mean, it's free to support female entrepreneurs. Um, all you have to do is just like help share something. If they ask you to help share it, like their posts, uh, recommend them to other people. It's like completely free and it doesn't cost you anything. So why not do it? I think a lot of people uh, don't like actively go out there and help support human focused businesses. But like I said, in order to create equity, we need to be doing a little bit extra for our female focused businesses and female entrepreneurs. So yeah, that's my one thing is regardless of whether you're a man or a woman, you can help you can help buy their products. You can, if you don't have enough money to do that, you can help share, you can help refer, recommend people. Nima. Like um, Andrea and Kasha say, to continue with the same line of thought, to not think of each other as man or woman. Uh, I mean, there is no divide here. To continue to think of each other as one and same and to, you know, like Michelle said, that is to encourage people. All of these uh, uh, suggestions, which all of my panelists said, are all one and the same. To encourage each other as humanity, to to be part of each other. I'm not a separate entity here sitting in India if Kevin and Michelle and Andrea and Kasha had not come together to make this SDG happen and to try to extend this same principle to us as, you know, when you go down, uh, the, there are nowadays, nowadays these simple random acts of kindness which people do for each other, right? Like it's just not for women or for a man or for an Indian or for a Mexican, which you think when you're doing something, you just do it because your heart is just that, your heart is love. So uh, extending what all of you said, just, just live a collective life. Well said. And, and I will say I am very fortunate to have three sisters and a loving mother. And, and I am a big believer in, in matriarchal societies and know that anything in my family, it's done well when it's done by one of my sisters or my mom. And, um, but I do think that men are just as much as they're part of the problem, they're very much critical for the solution. And we need to have these conversations. We got to force ourselves to have these uncomfortable conversations. And it's that's what it's about. Uh, I, I just, again, I look at all of you, Piranima, Andrea, Michelle, Kasha, L, you're all rock stars and you inspire me, you fire me up. I'm really excited for what's next. Um, again, any thoughts or questions or insights, let us know. And I know we kind of just gave final thoughts, but um, I'll just give it one last time. Any Anything you want to, if there's any final mic drop from any of you, um, you know, feel free to say it right now um, or, or we'll close it out here. That's fine. Uh, my, here's my mic drop, you know, my, my pen goes. Happy Friday to all of you. I hope you have the best weekend. Thank you again all so much. Follow, check us out at stgtalkspodcast.com. And again, to all the panelists, thank you. Much Thank love. you so much, Kevin. Thanks for having us. Thank you, great. all of you. Yeah. Take care. Have a good weekend. Thanks so much. Bye.